I'm going to kick things off now that it is 1101. I'd like to welcome everyone to the SBDC's introduction to Ghost Kitchen's webinar. This webinar will talk about how chefs, restaurant owners, real estate developers, and entrepreneurs can take advantage of this growing trend in delivery. Uh, I do want to first talk a little bit about the South Carolina SBDC. Uh, but before I do that, please allow me to introduce uh, the star of the show here, uh, Christopher Washington, who is the sales director for emerging brands and growth markets for Kitchen United. Uh, after I give a little bit of intro about the SBDC, I'll go back to you, Christopher, to talk about your background and how you came to be and what Kitchen United is. It sounds like a pretty awesome name, so we want to dive into that in a little bit. I am Ben Greenswag. I'm your SC SBDC CARES Act business consultant. Uh, what is the SBDC? Well, our mission is to advance South Carolina's economic development by helping entrepreneurs grow successful businesses. We offer no cost consulting. That is correct. If you are watching this webinar live or you view it on demand, you will notice that there is no charge associated with this. We do ask, however, that you complete the survey following this webinar so we know if we did good or not and how we can improve uh, and deliver more value to you, our constituents. So what do we offer here uh, at the, S, uh, the South Carolina SBDC? Uh, we offer pretty much so everything, any new business or existing business needs to thrive. We offer business plans, lending support. Obviously, over the past year and a half, there has been a tremendous amount of time and effort uh, helping our organizations tackle funding, whether it is PPP idle, both loan and forgiveness forgiveness, whether it has been the shuttered venue grant, some of the restaurant grants that are going around right now, ways to tap other sources of funding. Uh, there's been a lot of challenges in hiring. We have offered tremendous advice on how to help overcome those barriers, how to become more, con uh, more competitive. Um, who we help? Anyone. If you're interested in starting a business or you have one and you want to grow, uh, please do reach out to us. Uh, and again, we would like to offer no cost consulting. Um, you can reach us at Winthrop Regional SBDC at gmail.com. Our phone number is 803 323 2283. Or, of course, you can reply to any of the emails that you had received, and we will make sure that we move you into the right direction. So before we actually begin uh, about what is a ghost kitchen, I'm going to slightly rewind here to my opening slide, and I'll ask uh, my good friend, uh, Christopher Washington, to give a little bit of background on himself, how we got into this uh, space, what is Kitchen United, and then we're going to dive into it because this content might be a lot more relevant uh, than you think, especially if you're in this ecosystem. So Christopher, please give us your background. Yes, uh, thanks, Ben. Great to be here with you um, and with the SB, SBDC. Um, so a little bit about me. So I have been working and consulting with restaurants um, for the last 10 years. Um, started out on the supply side, supplying products to high-end restaurants in New, in New York City. Um, eventually gravitated towards um, really kind of solving the business problems of restaurants and and showing how they can scale. So that's how I got connected to Kitchen United. Um, we've been around, Kitchen United is a ghost kitchen provider with a bit of a hybrid model that we'll get into. Um, and we've been around for three years. Um, we're backed by Google Ventures um, and several realty groups. Um, and we're growing all around um, the nation right now. So this will be a great conversation and kind of show you all what we've learned um, through the pandemic and how we're kind of seeing growth happen um, over the next year or so. Great. Thank you, Christopher. All right. I am now going to go back and fast forward. All right. So ghost kitchen, we've heard a lot of different terms for this ghost kitchen, neighborhood kitchen, cloud kitchen, dark kitchen. What is this? Uh, maybe I've heard of it. Maybe I haven't. What is the basic introduction to what is a ghost kitchen? Yeah, a ghost kitchen is any space that doesn't have a legitimate front of house. So a ghost kitchen doesn't have in-seat dining, um, typically. Um, a ghost kitchen is, is also characterized by being in um, certain locales 
um, that are quicker, um, quick to consumers for delivery and takeout, um, but not prioritizing really kind of dine-in business. So that would look a little bit different. Um, they're also um, individually um, created kitchens. So you can have, you'll have your own kitchen space um, where you're, you, you have your own equipment inside of the space. Um, so that you can do your own product. They, they function in the back of house, just like a restaurant, um, except that you don't have a front of house. So would it be safe to say that for most, if not many of our um, community members in the restaurant industry, for the most part, they have operated as a ghost kitchen when pandemic guidelines were in place where there was no front of the house and they were basically focusing on their own version of delivery using either in-house or a DoorDash or an Uber Eats. Is that a fair assumption? Absolutely. Like th it was a crash course in ghost <laughs> kitchens, right? Like everybody had to transition into that model um, right. because we were already in it um, and our members were already in it. They were already acclimated um, to what that environment is. And basically they took their learnings from inside of our kitchen center and expanded it across their system. Um, this happened from, you know, the Chick-fil-A's of the world all the way down to the mom and pops. Everybody had to convert over and everybody had about a month. So you should know, everyone should be very aware of how this goes. So let's move the conversation from triage and becoming a ghost kitchen by default into, now that you've already been baptized by fire into this for many organizations, let's take a minute and look at this as a possible strategic growth opportunity for our business. So there are four, elements here on this slide um, about why I might want to pursue a ghost kitchen for my organization or multi-location. Um, let's take one at a time here for people to think about. So prime real estate, um, you know, we talk about that. Give us a little bit of sense on what is that connection to a ghost kitchen? Absolutely. So from our model, um, what we do is we look for restaurant um, spaces and we call them kitchen centers. So a kitchen center will have 10 individual kitchens that restaurants can, um, can lease from us. So those kitchen centers are located in high growth neighborhoods. Um, so we look for prime real estate that are really main and main. Um, others have a different slant on the model. Um, so you can have a different slant where they're looking for real estate that's prime, but maybe in the suburbs, right? Like, so it's closer to interstates where they can get in and out. Um, or um, taking over even um, uh, parking lots, right? Like wherever they can fit in, in order to really meet the demographic that they're going for, wherever that demographic is uh, across the city. Um, so it, it makes it kind of quicker again to the consumer. And this is really about data and defining who that consumer is. And then you as the entrepreneur or restaurateur um, choosing amongst the various companies, um, what really kind of aligns with your demographic. So uh, if I'm watching this live or on demand, how attractive is a college town for something like this? Very attractive. Um, colleges are, um, they've always had, uh, the, the students have always been kind of on the head of, head of the curve. Um, just to give a little bit of history, Chipotle was only around college campuses, right? Um, and that's how they had growth, right? Um, I knew as a student, I could walk in there and for $7, I could feed myself for two days, right? <laughs> um, and that appealed to me. And so right. once they got me as a student, then they kept me as the growth went. So, so students are a high demographic. Um, we have a facility in Austin that's very close to UT um, and UTA. Um, and, or I'm sorry, UTA. Um, and then we also have a couple other ones that are closer to like UCLA and LA and whatnot. It, it's very important. So let's talk about the consistent challenge, no matter what business you're in, but especially when you're in the food service industry, reach more customers. I know we'll dive a little bit more into this, but give us a bit of a sense on what you know, what a company like a Kitchen United or, or why someone should look at a ghost kitchen, might I say, how, what could they expect in terms of really demand generation and expanding um, their, their customer base? How, how do those two go hand in hand? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it comes down to looking at the differences between um, being a, a brick and mortar restaurant and a ghost kitchen, right? Um, brick and mortar, you're using, you're, you're going to get a space that gets a lot of walk through, like walk by traffic, right? That's your marketing. You'll have your signboard out front. You're, 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 um, you're betting that you're going to have um, a walk score where people are walking by, they're seeing your business, they're, you're getting that lift. Digital forces you to be digital, right? If you don't have that forefront, then you're forced to reach a wider set of consumers. Um, so by necessity, because you know we all know how it works when we Google something, right? Um, the top 10 results, that first page, those are gonna get the clicks. Very, very rarely do we click through page two, page three, page four. That's the same way that these apps work. Um, you know, if you're on DoorDash, if you're on Grubhub, if you're on Uber Eats, or if it's your website that's being crawled by, uh, by Google um, for ranking, the more digital connections that you have, the more links that you have on your website, increase your, um, your market share. So you have the opportunity by focusing on digital to definitely reach more customers. So let's move into expansion and support other considerations on this as a model obviously expansion um i want to maybe phrase this in a way that appeals to the audience that might only have you know a single location maybe a second what's the turnkey expansion why is it easier why why might that be another consideration to look at this model yeah, um, if you have one restaurant, you know exactly how much that restaurant costs for you to create, right? Um, and typically it wasn't just a little bit of money. Um, so what we call that is, is your CapEx, your capital expenditure, you know, like your capital expenditure. Um, so all of that, what everything that's included in that is building, lease, fixed costs, right? Um, and then you have your variable, variable costs of staff, um, product, and what have you. Um, so that's kind of set. Typically that happens for a restaurant right around $250,000, $300,000 on the low end. It can go up from there. Um, with the ghost kitchen model, you can basically be operating in a month, a month and a half um, and be, you know, um, doing that at a cost that's probably, you know, we're talking 25% of that number. So maybe around 25 to 30 um, maybe 10% of that number, like 25 to $30,000 um, all in. Uh, and so that's what's really a appealing. So you can go into um, a new space, a new area to test out the market. Maybe you want to build a brick and mortar, um, but you're not sure if you're going to have demand. So you can come in, work on your digital inside the ghost kitchen model, and then have plans to build out later on down the road. Um, so it's flexible and you don't have a lot of risk up front. So we're going to get into the pros and cons of considerations in a moment, but clearly, you know, when you see the word support <laughs> and you're in the restaurant industry, you know, yes, yes, and yes, especially these days, what kind of support could someone expect from a ghost kitchen, you know, environment? Uh, it varies. Um, I would say our model is on the, on the spectrum um, trending towards higher support. Um, so we'll give you support in marketing. Um, we support, like I said, your front of house. We do the front of house. So if consumers come in, then we're actually helping them to um, pick up their orders, check out drivers, make, you know, um, uh, make orders as well. Um, so we do that. We also do um, consulting on how to do your digital marketing, right? Um, because Google, we're, we're a partner with Google. Google has invested in us. Um, we have access to knowledge and we share that knowledge with our operators inside of our facility. Um, other models outside of ours um, can be 100% hands off, right? Like, so they can take your business model, put it in their ghost kitchen, and then they operate it. Um, so then you're just, you know, you're, you're checking in, you're telling them, you're guiding them. Um, and so then you, on the other side, there's 100%, it's just up to you. But I think that most of the models have that level of support in order to activate you um, and align you because it is a little bit, um, it's a little bit different, but I think coming out of the pandemic, 
Um, most of those lessons have been learned and now it's about how do you actualize them? And that's really kind of where we, um, that's our competitive advantage, I would say. So let's talk about the pros and cons because I hear all that. I'm like, it's all perfect. Sign me up. <laughs> I'm ready to go. But clearly there are some pros and cons like all things in life going forward. So let's take a little bit of this uh, one at a time here. So let's talk about the cost to get started. Um, in your experience, give us, the, give us the pro and con of cost to get started. Yeah, so the cost to get started is typically around for us, it's, it's around $50,000. Um, $50,000 is um, how much it would cost for you to either buy or lease equipment, um, go through all your permits, um, and then, um, you know, pay for all your fees that you have um, through us. Um, that's kind of the high end number. Low end number is right around 20, 25,000, depending on, you know, your, your equipment package. Um, so you can kind of see that the cost is already low. Um, and most of that, to be honest, um, a big portion of that budget is on is marketing, um, is that we we actually require people to have, um, you know, a decent amount of marketing spend from their launch so that they can get that lift. So that's that's kind of how we look at COGS. Two questions on that, if I can. One, do you find that most companies that pursue Ghost Kitchens are startup or already have an existing location and looking for expansion? I think that they're varied. Um, we have enterprise level accounts um, and then we have startups. Uh, we only work with customers that have at least one or two restaurants. Okay. Um, just because um, there are other avenues if, you're, if you are a startup that um, you can take and we will guide you towards that. Um, but generally speaking, I would say most of them are in kind of the growth mode where they have like uh, three to five locations and they're looking to expand. And then the second question that has come up, which is supply chain, particularly on the food services side, not as widely distributed as say a manufacturing supply chain, but certainly over the past 18 months, we've seen challenges out there. Can a partner like a Kitchen United or others, you know, do you help on the supply chain side with these with these uh, with with these kitchens? Yeah, we we have um, those relationships. Um, so, like for instance, we have relationships with Cisco and U.S. Foods. Okay. Um, we have we have relationships with co-packers and also um, the delivery companies. So, what we do is try and use our system-wide leverage to get lower brokered pricing for individual okay. accounts. Um, so that's something that has been a big focus for us over the last year, so that you can get those supply costs down. Um, you know, Cisco has a really great program for ghost kitchens and that's that's already set up. So I recommend people like looking into that if they're interested in it, um, particularly if you're interested in running something out of your own space, um, then that that's a great place to get started. Um, US Foods has a whole um, menu creator um, that also backs into um, your supply chain um, so that you can have a direct per plate cost on what it's going to cost you to do this and run all of your numbers. So um, those are partnerships that have been created that we have um, building upon the systems of, you know, those, those Fortune 500 companies. Great. Thank you. Let's talk about time to go live. So I want to do it. I'm ready to go. I've raised the capital or I'm taking existing cash flows and you know, what's the time frame from I want to go ahead and open up a ghost kitchen to I'm actually starting to see some revenue through the door? Yeah, um, it can go as fast as you want it to go. So okay. um, the fastest we've seen someone go live in our system was um, it started, it, they started the process, uh, you know, day one, and they were live in about two and a half weeks. Wow. <laughs> um, the longest time um, is about five months. Um, that was a brand that had to do, you know, they had, um, you know, a custom oven that they wanted to install. And so they were kind of going more of the, you know, brick and mortar route. Right. Um, so it, it's really about your, your plan, but typically it takes about 30 to 45 days. So when you're considering the pros and cons, um, depending on your source of capital, 
you need to be in that mindset 30 to 45 days of investment until you start seeing revenue generation to come back into that to service your debt or other uh, obligations. Um, is yeah, that, a good, and I is would, that a good sense or, or yeah, please. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I, I would say that that's a good starting point. Most of the ghost kitchen models work different from um, a regular lease in the sense that you don't get charged for your lease, which is going to be your biggest cost in, until you go live. So until that start date, you won't be charged, which is different from, you know, a brick and mortar where you're charged as soon as you sign the lease, basically, um, or whatever that start date, once they hand you the keys, then you're being charged. So it's a little bit of a different model and it's structured that way for speed to market. Um, the faster you can get in, the faster that you're operating, the faster everybody's making money. Great. Well, that's a good segue into what I think is probably our largest challenge these days, which is staffing. So let's talk a little bit about the pro cons and what you've seen about staffing. Um, I don't think there are any pros right now, <laughs> to be honest. Fair point. Uh, uh, staffing is, uh, I mean, staffing is tough. Um, I think that staffing in the bigger cities is tougher than in what we say, um, consider secondary markets. Um, so primary markets for us are the Chicago's, New York, LA, Miami, um, Austin. Those are like number one high populous markets. Um, second tier markets for us and third tier markets for us that are in between one to five million in population, one to seven million in population. Um, those markets are having a easier time um, than in the larger cities because a lot of the people in the big cities moved out that were in the right. restaurant areas. So for instance, in New York City, people that were living in Brooklyn or Manhattan or what have you and working in all of those restaurants, they all moved to New Jersey, White Plains, New York, um, down to Pennsylvania. They all exited um, that area. I don't think that the, that attrition we haven't seen in smaller locales um, like Scottsdale, Arizona or um, Austin, Texas. So they're able to hire a little bit better. Um, so that's something that um, has been a challenge um, right now. I think that if you're running um, and developing a business plan for it, uh, what we say is that instead of looking at it like I need a general manager um, and then from the general manager, I'm going to have um, some, some line cooks. Um, really what you want to look for is a hybrid in, in employee, right? Like that is a line cook plus general manager in one. Um, so where you would probably pay a line cook $10 an hour and a general manager around 25, you're probably looking for one person that can do it at 17, $18 an hour. Um, and that person is out there in the market. Um, they're commanding now a price point between 18 and $20. Well, considering there seems to be a lot of racing towards that $15 an hour benchmark, um, I understand that that might make financial sense given where we are right now and the challenges. So I appreciate that. Um, well, listen, expenses, revenue, it all comes down to, you know, the potential AUV. Why don't you talk a little about that? Potential AUV. Um, for brands that are known, um, that are known in your area, whether you're um, a, a hot local brand or a brand that is coming with a refreshed uh, marketing strategy, you know, typically like you can turn on the lights and you're looking at doing between 250 to $300,000 um, the moment that you turn on the lights. Uh, and that's just because of how DoorDash and, and um, Uber Eats operate. If you're doing the correct things, then you'll be doing those numbers. Now that's not a fantastic number, right? Um, I, I think that most brands want to do probably around five to 600,000 in order to break even. Um, we've seen brands that can do in our system on average, they do about 700, 750. Um, you can go up as like, that means on the high end, we have brands that are doing two and a half, three million. Um, on the low end, we're doing like 300, 350 or so, but it really comes down to what your overall cost is um, mm -hmm. to really kind of know like what your potential AUV is, uh, will be, or um, is this a new market, legacy market, um, you know, like a lot of brands also kind of offload. So what they were doing in during the pandemic, let's say through takeout and delivery, they no longer have the capacity to keep doing that inside of their restaurant. 
um, with in-house dining now back. So they'll offload that to a ghost kitchen. So then that basically you take that number and you can just kind of transition it over directly into a ghost kitchen. Um, so typically we say that when you're starting off, think, look at your current delivery numbers um, and your takeout numbers, and you can kind of take that number and really kind of situate it directly into um, the space as a starting point. Well, let's, let's let that all dovetail to the final end, which is payback. What's your sense on pros and cons and what are you looking about on the payback side? Um, payback is faster um, because you don't have the overall capex. So where payback could be 10 to 15 years in a regular kitchen space, um, in the ghost kitchen, you're looking at a two to five year payback. Um, so you're, you're, it, it's, it's accelerated um, and you should be managing towards that type of level. Um, because most of the costs are going to be front loaded, um, which would be your, um, you know, equipment, also your, um, um, you know, your, your costs to start up in our space, like the lease costs. Um, but up after that, like your variable costs decreases, um, uh, like exponentially actually, um, so that you're able to kind of just like operate, um, at very thin margins in order to kind of. Um, pay back all of that built-in capital that you received. Have you seen any correlation between number of ghost kitchen sites and that payback calculation? I mean, obviously it has to respond to demand. You're not going to put two sites in the same city of 100,000 people necessarily, but maybe you do. Uh, again, that's kind of your world here. So do you see any quicker pathways from multiple ghost kitchen sites? Uh, it depends on how they perform. Um, okay. We look at it as each one is kind of on its own island and each one should be sustainable in and of itself. Um, so I would say that not, not, not as far as a system, um, but if they are closer, then we would look at the aggregate number because then it's about marketing. So if they're in kind of the same area in the same city, one's on the north side, one's on the south side, then we would look at it as an aggregate. Um, market and see how much saturation you get. Got it. All right. So let's kind of move into key considerations. So um, questions that if you're interested in, in expanding or, or investing in a ghost kitchen for yourself, some of the things that you need to, uh, you need to ask yourself here. So I'm going to ask you um, to just kind of give us the top line on, on these bullet points that we've put out here as well. Um, so non-traditional opportunities expand realistically. I mean, that's the key word, right? Expand realistically. What advice would you give someone to think about, are they expanding realistically? Yeah. Like if you're, if you're based in South Carolina, then it might not be the best opportunity to go to LA. Right. Um, and so we, we always say move locally first. So, um, you know, look for something in, um, in your area where you can manage it, where you can um, um, have control over it uh, so that you can really get the results um, from your spend. And I think listen to your customers and regular drivers. Um, I think that's obviously something you should be doing regardless. But are there any additional insights, especially when considering a ghost kitchen, that the drivers can tell you? that you should be listening or asking for any key indications there? Yeah, so um, drivers rate you, right? Like they rate your restaurant, um, just like we rate Uber drivers and Lyft drivers and they can rate us, they can rate your restaurant. So they can rate your restaurant and this would apply to your brick and mortar as well, right? Like how friendly your staff are to them. Um, do you provide a restroom for them, right? Um, is there space for them to be without being in the normal queue for consumers so that they can kind of get in and get out? Right. So if a driver complains to your staff, it's, it's actually very important. Um, and so you would want to take that feedback and see how you can kind of rearrange things inside of your space in order to make um, the delivery egress um, uh, better for those drivers because they're also a consumer. Um, and the, if they rank you lower then you, the algorithm works, it will rank you lower. Right. Um, and so that's just how it works. Um, keep it simple, a great strategy for any business. I have to say, um, give us a little bit more what you mean about boil down your to go systems that we have here on this slide. What do you mean by that? So what that means is that, um, when, if you're in your, um, brick and mortar restaurant, 
Um, what people have been doing lately is separating out their lines. They can have an in-house line um, where all their in-house food is going to be made and that's where it's gonna be prepped and, um, and, and um, finished. And then you have your to-go line or um, pickup line and delivery line. Um, and so the two have to be um, very tight, right? Um, or you have to have a system in which if it's all on one line, a system in which you know if someone's sitting down, they shouldn't be put, they shouldn't be constantly pushed backwards, right? Um, inside the queue so that they're waiting 30, 45 minutes and then you're just getting all the takeout orders because those, those drivers are sitting there and people right. are coming back and telling you, hey, well, I need my food. So it's really good if you're operating both in a brick and mortar capacity to kind of separate that out. In a ghost kitchen model, you definitely have to separate out your um, to-go line and then pre-orders or delivery orders um, because those delivery drivers are coming in fast if they get rewarded by getting there quicker. So you really need to have food out in like two to three minutes um, on those orders and waiting for the driver so that they can get it to the consumer within 15 to 25 minutes of ordering, right? So that you don't get dinged back on the back end for refunds and things like that. Speaking of technology, uh, restaurants and their digital storefront, happier customers. I, I will admit, I don't expect every restaurant that I frequent, even the real local ones here to have an app like Chick-fil-A. But the fact that there are still a good amount of restaurants where I just can't find their menu online uh, is, is shocking to me, especially 18 months into a pandemic. So, I mean, clearly better digital storefront, happier customers. Seems pretty basic to me. Anything I'm missing there? No, um, you got it. I mean, I think that uh, got to have a menu, <laughs> you know, whether it's right. one of those QR codes or what right. have you, like we, we got to have something. Right. Um, and restaurants that invest in standing out. Um, there's a lot of ways you could stand out. Uh, give me an example of what you mean about standing out that you've seen be uh, successful. Um, so one of the key things that I think uh, a lot of people don't recognize is that if you have an Italian restaurant, it might be like Giovanni's, like not to be so bland, but okay. like, it's you not know, a G common term, <laughs> you know, Giovanni's restaurant. Um, but if I'm looking at the app, the app won't score you based on that name, right? If you have Giovanni's Italian restaurant. Mm then you're going to be registered higher inside the app. Um, and so I think that if you scroll through now, you'll start to see it. Now you'll see, um, you know, where it'd be like, um, you know, chicken wasn't like dominant in their name. Now chicken is like there. It's like Joe's chicken, right? right. Like it, it's, it has to be spelled out so that the algorithm can pick it up. Um, consumers are intuitive, right? We're, we intuitively know that if we see Giovanni's or um, if we see Auntie May's, right? Like that Giovanni's is gonna be Italian. Auntie May's might be Southern comfort food, right? We, we, we're intuitive enough to figure that out, but the algorithm isn't smart enough. So in order to stand out on the algorithm, that actually allows you to stand out to the consumer. All right. so. An area that I'm interested in tremendously is something that I did not know existed until we spoke, um, which is a key consideration on whether or not you want to look at a ghost kitchen, which is, are you a hot local? Um, what is a hot local? It might mean something a lot different than I thought it was growing up 30 years ago. So <laughs> what's a hot local? <laughs> so a hot local, uh, local in this context is um, what you see on here. This is actually Beasley's Chicken and Waffles. Um, Beasley's Chicken and Waffles is um, managed by Ashley Christensen um, here in North Carolina. Um, she has five different restaurants. Um, a hot local is really characterized by just do people pack it in and um, are they willing to wait up to an hour to kind of come in there at a particular day part. So it doesn't mean that you have to be busy all the time. It just means on those key times, like during brunch times, during dinner times, um, during like a basketball game, do people look at you as the place to go? Mm -hmm. um, if that is the case, then that's a great 
use case to transition your business so that you can reach a wider audience. And that's really what it is, where the, it, when the audience thinks like, oh, I would go, but I don't want to be in that hour and a half line. Yeah. Now it's, oh, I can order for delivery and we'll have the same quality right here at my house. And I'm going to invite over some friends, right, um, and order it from here. So that's kind of the characteristic characterization that we make. I know many of those here in the Myrtle Beach area that absolutely qualify as a hot local. Um, all right. So um, what can a company like Kitchen United do for you? So obviously we talked about the pros and the cons and it's that chart on the first slide, but let's say I'm interested and I want to have another conversation. Hey, I want to talk to Christopher. What are you, what are you going to do for me? I have the hottest, you know, chicken and waffle joint here in, uh, in, in Myrtle Beach. What, what does that look like? Yeah. So we would, we would kind of go through a couple of different options, right? Um, are you looking to um, franchise? Like, are you looking to franchise by like um, um, getting franchisees into your system? Um, so if that's the case, if you're looking at getting franchisees into your system, then we could be an opportunity to work with that new franchisee um, and get them started and negotiate a rate so that all new franchisees that you get will be able to come in at that rate all across the country, right? Um, so that's a way for you to quickly expand without having to deal with real estate, which is like the biggest um, concern when you're looking at the franchising and franchising model. Um, I would also say that um, if you're interested in um, licensing your brand, right? Like, so let's say that you have a wonderful brand. It does extremely well. You want to test it out in a different market. Um, you could reach out. You could say, um, I have everything put together. I have a brand book. Um, we're ready to like kind of explore this process. Um, and what we could do is take that, take your brand and then put that brand into one of our ghost kitchens being operated as what we call a, um, a virtual kitchen um, inside of our space. And so virtual kitchens are characterized by, um, you know, it's just a, a virtual storefront, but it's being managed and operated by someone else. Or you could do um, the option that we spent the most time today is you can operate a ghost kitchen. Um, if you operate the ghost kitchen, you would come in just as we explained um, and, um, and work to expand your growth. So I'm sure the answer is going to be varied, but I have to ask it anyway. Are there certain types of cuisines um, or types of food that you have found in your uh, experience tend to lend themselves a little bit more to being successful or, and, and on the contrary, hey, there's not a lot of X. So if you're really good at X, this might be something to think about. Um, I'll start with the, with the um, if there, <laughs> there's one that, that we would need um, I would say that more plant-based food. Um, so plant-based is, is killing it. Um, and it doesn't have to be kind of like what I think was previously thought of as vegetarian food right now. Like the main category is, um, like vegan junk food, right? Where you can get a hamburger that tastes nearly like a hamburger using impossible meat. Um, and it's, it's like a, you know, like a different type of cheese, like a soy cheese, but it basically is a burger. Right. Um, and those are flying out the door. Um, you know, like, so something in that category would really be great. Um, I think that also another, another avenue, if you're really good at something, um, I would say chicken. If you're good at doing um, any type of um, chicken, chicken sandwich, chicken tenders, um, you know, if your restaurant has a legacy restaurant, if you're a legacy restaurant and that was something that like all the kids loved is like the chicken tenders, you could actually pull that item out and build out a whole nother concept around that. If you have a great recipe for it, um, chicken, fried chicken, fried fish, um, anything you fry. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you fry, those things do extremely, extremely well. All right, excellent. And then let's kind of spend our last few minutes here on other opportunities. You know, people who are watching live or on demand might be in the real estate market. They might be entrepreneurs. Um, you know, what are the other opportunities with Ghost Kitchens? And let's start on the real estate uh, side. You know, obviously, I know that there have been lots of investment 
uh, nationally in sort of uh, the old um, malls that have fallen out. They're nice century located, um, but obviously there are other spaces as well. So what's what's the real estate angle here? Yeah, so for for real estate companies, like this is an opportunity to kind of partner, um, you know, let's say if you have a, a, a large portfolio or you're a real estate company that has a portfolio, um, there is an opportunity to be able to um, have us uh, to, to basically partner with us, bring us into your space, um, pitch us your space, we'll help build it out. Or, or we'll do it collectively and, and kind of refresh um, an area. Um, so we do this for kind of the food hall model um, where we have, um, you know, where it's more engagement with the community and we kind of building this collectively. So that's something that could happen. Um, and it happens uh, quite often, I, I would say um, right now, like especially because as you mentioned, malls, like we have a partnership with Westfield Valley Mall um, where we've partnered with them to come in and kind of run our model outside, uh, out inside of their mall. Um, we have, uh, we do, we're doing partnerships with um, sports arenas. Um, I mean, we're kind of stretching the model um, of real estate and seeing like what we can actually do. So we're, um, if you're working real estate, we'd love to talk to you. And I know entrepreneurs is the second one, but there are actually two questions I'm going to weave into this. I think we've talked a lot about the entrepreneur angle. In fact, I think 99% of this has been entrepreneurs. Um, one of the questions came in, which is talk about micro businesses that have outgrown their home kitchens. Um, mm -hmm. What have you seen? Give us your thoughts on that one. Um, we love them actually. So um, micro businesses, um, for all those who don't who don't know, like have been operating outside of their um, maybe out of their home kitchen space or out of a commissary kitchen, right? Um, and so those those businesses, once you have reached that threshold, I think the threshold um, is like fifty to seventy five thousand dollars in sales. Once you reach that threshold that's actually a perfect segue into um, a ghost kitchen because you're building upon those sales. So that's something that you always wanna do. You, if you're already working in kind of this virtual capacity, it's not gonna be hard for you to transition over into um, kind of this um, more set space. And um, really you're looking for something that's gonna be an upgraded commissary where you have dedicated commissary space, um, but those have worked great. I would say that the biggest challenge um, would be is that once you um, move up, you're going to have to put a lot of emphasis on marketing as well. So marketing, marketing, marketing throughout mm -hmm. that growth, those growth stages in order for you to get your returns. But we love them. And then here's a question, which would be, where could someone find a place? Uh, where would someone find a good place to find a ghost kitchen or a restaurant that has commercial space for rent in the Charleston area? So if someone is... Uh, looking to invest or move or want to explore that specific community, where do they go? Where do they start that journey? Um, so the first place would be to just search online on Google um, for okay. commissary kitchens. Um, commissary kitchens is like the starting point. Um, what you're going to probably want to do is like, because there's no real aggregator of all these ghost kitchen spaces, um, we're kind of one of the few companies that's very public about like where we have brands, but there are a lot of local um, businesses that operate as ghost kitchens. So um, really the food truck industry inside of your um, community is the place to go. So wherever the food trucks are going to prep their food, um, to, um, um, you know, like dump out all of their wastewater. Um, and oil, like they have to have a certified facility for that. That certified facility, facility is typically a ghost kitchen or a commissary um, or a restaurant that has those permits. So I would begin reaching out to um, food truck operators um, or hunting that down um, via, like once you type in commissary, food truck, Charleston, you'll start to get results. All right, I'm gonna leave up our last slide uh, and see if we have any more inbound questions. I have one more for you as well. These are contact details you know, for myself and Christopher. Um, as of today, what percentage of the food services industry are ghost kitchens? And give us some sense on where you see that going in two, three, four, five years. Um, I'm just curious where, where you see that trajectory going forward. 
I mean, right now we're like under 1% mm -hmm. um, of ghost kittens. Um, uh, so we're very small. Um, we know that um, the delivery and delivery first model is growing right now and it's growing, you know, hey, the pandemic sped it up, um, sped up that growth. So right now in year 2020 um, and for year 2020 numbers, if it's sustained in 2021, we're really four or five years in the future, right? right. That's how far the pandemic kind of sped up the numbers um, that we were seeing in delivery. That's why DoorDash went public, right? Because there was no better time right. um, than, than during the pandemic because their numbers look so great. Um, so we know that this is the trajectory and that's how it's going to go. Um, we expect that, um, you know, our plans, like we're, we have plans to build 500 of these over the next seven years, um, kitchen centers. Um, I would say that our competitors have plans to do even more. Um, right. you know, like they're like, we're, we're going to start hitting, everyone's trying to hit that thousand marker. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's all going to come down to capital and, um, and kind of what the next, what the future holds, but you know, it, it's going to be growing. Um, and right now we're seeing that it's growing right now about 15%, um, annually, like for our market, we're growing 15% year over year of new kitchen locations that are coming up. All right, and last question, which we obviously need to ask because uh, of what we've gone through, just fortune favors are prepared, right? As we emerge from the pandemic and, uh, you know, we do, there is light at the end of the tunnel in many ways. What is the biggest risk, do you think, or threat to the ghost kitchen, um, the ghost kitchen environment? Um, I think the biggest risk is not knowing who your consumers are. Um, and if your consumers are, let's say if you're a steakhouse and, um, your consumers enjoy going into the steakhouse and sitting down and being with friends and having a great steak, um, and you don't know, and you can't deliver that steak at the same quality delivered, then it's not a good model for you. Um, and I think it's okay to say that. I think that not everything has to be for everybody, right? Um, and I think that having that realistic look and at your business and what your business model is, um, who are your consumers, then you can kind of see, is this something that I want to pull out? Um, and then also knowing your numbers, if you're, if you have a restaurant and it's, and it's, um, a bar, right. And so 55% of your income is coming from bar sales and people then also order food then it's probably not going to be the best model for you, you know, but, you know, maybe in the near future, you should be doing alcohol delivery because you have such great <laughs> content, right? So the model's yeah. flexible, but I think we all just have to be um, honest with ourselves and with our partners and, um, you know, just be very clear on who we're targeting. And I, I think that um, that would mitigate a lot of that risk, but that's inherently true is that if you don't know your customer and who you're targeting when you get in, um, then it's going to be hard to uh, gain them. Wonderful. Christopher, I really can't thank you enough. I've had the pleasure of working with Kitchen United uh, on other opportunities. You've always presented great thought leadership, a very fair uh, approach and a good way for those that are interested to assess the opportunity. Um, I really, once again, want to thank you so much for your time. I do know how busy you are these days. Uh, folks, um, you know, we are not necessarily endorsing Kitchen United, but Listen, they're smart folks like Christopher uh, who knows what they're doing and uh, he's a great contact going forward. I wanna remind everyone the SBDC does offer no cost consulting. Please do look us up. We wanna help your business grow uh, and do please complete the survey uh, that will be sent to you afterwards. So live on demand, uh, these slides will be made available to you. Uh, and on that note, I wanna once again, thank Christopher and Kitchen United. Thank you to the South Carolina SBDC. Thank you all for attending live and on demand. And I wish everyone an absolutely wonderful rest of their day. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Ben.